Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Marie Vigourou. And I'm Drew Shulman. In this episode, we're diving into Supernatural Season 1, Episode 1, Pilot. Let's get this show on the road. So, before we get started, how about we tell our listeners who we are? Mary, I will ask you to go first. Well, thank you. That's very chivalrous of you. I appreciate that. (laughs) So let's start with the important things. My passion is dialogue. So that means trying to understand something, whether that's a topic, an issue, a book, a movie, or in this case, a TV show, by discussing it with others and merging our perspectives to get a good, deep understanding of whatever it is that we're discussing. I mean, honestly, I just really love it when people walk away from a conversation with like a better or even a different understanding of the topic than they did before, right? And and luckily, that's actually my job. I'm so lucky. I'm, I'm like a master's student at McGill University, and my thesis project is about understanding the experiences of teenage girls living with scoliosis through dialogue and conversation. So, I mean, I guess in a way, I'm getting a degree in how to talk to people, <laughs> <laughs> which is going to come in handy for this podcast, I think. I'm, I'm really looking forward to trying to better understand each episode of Supernatural, but also the series as a whole, frankly. And, I mean, who better to discuss this with than you, Drew? Aw, you're too kind to me. But I will, as I'm following your lead in jumping into the show, I will do the same with the formatting for how I will introduce myself. Aww. My passion is lore and mythology. I mean, whether I'm jumping into a new TV show or picking up a video game I've been playing for way too many years, the thing that keeps me invested, the reason I keep coming back to these shows and movies and podcasts and anything content-wise, is an amazing narrative woven by these brilliant characters and these incredible worlds they put together. Mm -hmm. I mean, a good show is good, but a good show with a universe full of history, secrets, legends, lore, myths is just phenomenal. Yeah. I myself... Didn't finish school, but I did study film, photography, and radio, which has led me to a life of both watching and working in media from multiple angles, if I may. I've been, I've been, I am a voice actor. I've hosted a few other small productions and podcasts before this one. Uh, I've worked on a few student films, both in front of and behind the camera and on the editing side in a few cases. I'm in my wheelhouse here. Working on a project like this really is something I love doing. It's putting my passions, my abilities, and my skills all in the right place. And I really am looking forward to diving into a show that I kind of know a bit about, but really only on a very surface level. And I hear people talk about it with such passion and like fervor. So for me, I really want to jump in and hope to bring other people with me. I hope other people jump into this podcast and go, hey, I'm ready to start a new show too and follow along with the two of us. That's so exciting. Honestly, I'm really excited to get to this, Drew. Thank you so much for like going on this journey with me. Well, I'm glad I could be following you along. And may I ask, would you like to explain what this podcast is about? Sure. So with Supernatural ending this year, um, I found myself wishing that I could get that feeling again of watching the series for the first time. And after speaking with you... Uh, I realized that you'd never actually watched the series fully. And so I thought that it could be fun to start a podcast to record our adventure in rewatching Supernatural for me and watching it for the first time for you. Now, every week we're going to go over one episode of Supernatural and we're going to do this in two steps. First, we're going to look at the story as sacred, you know, the gospel of the Winchesters, if you may. Um, And that means we're going to treat the characters as if they're not characters written by flawed people, but real people themselves. So we'll dive into the relationships of the show and personal growth and the decisions. Oh my God, the decisions on this show. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. For example, that's when we would be talking about Dean's relationship with women, uh, the boys' relationship with their parents and Bobby, or even like the evolution of Crowley's character, for example. 
Step two, we're going to be looking at the episode more critically and discuss the writers, the producers, the actors, and even the network's decisions to air the show as it is, as the product that it has become through their work. And this is really where we get to wonder if the way that Dean treats women in the early seasons is really a reflection of Dean or a reflection of like what society considers appropriate. And then, of course, at the end, Drew, your favorite part, we make a deal at the crossroads. (laughs) And this is where we basically wish for something. And since we can't really exchange it for our soul, you know, uh, we'll offer up something else uh, from the episode in return. So with that out of the way, I wanted to explain the title of the show because I feel like it is a bit of a pun based on as anyone who's watched the show before and even as myself not having watched the show in its entirety, only seeing bits here and there. Even I'm aware of this constant use of the song Carry On My Wayward Son for their season recaps. Uh, We thought it kind of fit us very well. Mary here, as she said, has watched the show. Uh, At this point, I've... Do you know how many times you've watched through exactly? Um, nope. (laughs) I've lost count. Okay. Yeah, which to me means probably four to seven times at least at this point. That's why we're carrying on. Mary has seen the show many times. And this is for her is just another watch through with a fun new twist on it. And I, I am a wayward son. I am someone who, by all intent and purpose, should love this show. I adore Monster of the Week type shows. I'm a huge fan of other shows in the same genre like Buffy. I love Supernatural as a subject. I just love mythology and creatures and lore. And I was also a really big Gilmore Girls fan. And I really like Dean slash Sam, so... Really, there should be no reason why I didn't watch the show up until now, except that for some reason it kind of didn't sit well with me partway through, and even in my first watch I never saw all of it, so I'm a wayward son returning to the rightful path of watching the show properly. So this gives us a chance to look at the show, as Mary said, through both her eyes, someone who's seen the whole show and knows what's coming, and myself, someone who I, as you will see today in our discussion of the first episode... I recall a lot of little things, but was reminded so quickly of why I did get into it in the first place. And as we get further in, we'll obviously discuss why I fell out of love with it later on. Uh, And I believe it is also worth mentioning that, uh, as we keep saying, Mary has seen all of it up to this point. Uh, That's an important thing because the show is not done yet. The show is not done yet, but it is ending. And at the point where we are currently recording this podcast episode, there are four episodes left to air in the series before the end. And so definitely a lot of emotions here. And, uh, and that was certainly a catalyst for me to, to, to want to, to start this podcast so that the adventure and the, the story, the saga and the brothers can live on. So tell me a bit more about that. Sure. I mean, so like I said, I knew that Supernatural was uh, ending soon, obviously. Um, And I was thinking of ways to keep it alive in my own life. Um, I mean, so I've been watching this show for the last four years. I was introduced to it by our producer extraordinaire, Rochelle, um, who has been watching it from the very beginning, from season one. 15 years ago. And I mean, this show really quickly became a very important part of my life. I ended up contacting you because I knew that you had worked on podcasts before and I knew that I needed that expertise in order to be able to to, to put out a podcast that would be interesting. And I also knew that you hadn't seen the entire series, but that you would really give it the care and attention that it really deserved. And so (laughs) honestly, seeing you watch it for the first time, I knew that that would be the closest thing that I could get to actually watching it for the first time myself. (laughs) Yeah, and so then pretty quickly after that, uh, our producer, Rochelle, jumped on board. And, well, I mean, look at us. Here we are. Here we are. Yeah, so this gives us a very nice way to send the show off. So with with our our intro, our, our, our slightly longer than normal intro, we will not be repeating this every episode. We figure if you're listening to episode two and beyond, you've probably listened to episode one. If not, I always hear podcasts talk about fans getting on the show at a weird episode, and I'm like, how do you do that? I, I need to start at the beginning, but that's a story for another day. Uh, let's get into uh, our episode one recap. All right, Drew, how about you get us started with our very first recap? 
So, we start with a adorable baby, an adorable family, a... I'm trying to do this quick, but I'm not on a timer. Um, very wholesome life. Everything seems very normal. Nothing that, like, leads you to think there's something more going on here. Um, mom wakes up in the middle of the night, sees their father with uh, Sam in the uh, in the crib, goes downstairs, realizes, wait, if Sam's down, uh, if dad is downstairs on the couch watching TV half asleep, then who was with my baby? And, <sighs> yeah. I will admit, even as someone who loves a good horror movie, like, that gives you chills, those moments of, like, character realization, you really connect to them. Full chills. Yeah, no, chills. Full chills. <laughs> Full oh body chills. Oh my god, chills. I know. <laughs> and, like, and like, all again, I admit, as you heard in my recap, like, I, I know what's coming. Like, I knew, like, oh, right, that's totally not Dad up there. And it still gives mm-hmm. you chills. Yeah. Anyways, we hear screaming. Dad runs upstairs. Uh, I'm going to have to learn his name eventually because I keep saying Dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's John. <laughs> John, thank you. My God. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to. I'm terrible with names. It'll take me a while. But John okay. runs upstairs, finds, uh, I remember this one. Baby totally fine. Baby Sam. But... Something is dripping on his, on, on his pillow. What could it be? I guess we'll look up at the ceiling. And, oh, hi, Mary. Um, yeah, you shouldn't be on the ceiling. That's a bad thing. It seems not natural. You might even call it supernatural. Ooh. Um, I, I forget. Remind me now if I'm forgetting. Does she say something before she bursts into flames? She does not. Okay, I don't know why I had a memory for saying something and if it was just in my head. But oh, well. flames... Oh? Oh. <laughs> Don't spoil, but okay, nope. now I'm now I'm now I'm intrigued. <laughs> um but yes. She bursts into flames, the walls behind her tend to. Uh whole house goes up. Uh John hands Sam to Dean, says run. Dean as a good boy just does. And then John comes out after them. So obviously he stayed in the house for something. I I mean I, I assume we're supposed to believe it's to try to save his wife, but there's that part of me that's like, mm, is that all he was doing in the house before he ran away? Um and then we kind of cut to today, to modern day. And we have, uh, oh my god, this is going to be so tough. As a Gilmore Guys fan, I'm going to keep saying Sam and Dean wrong. <laughs> we have Sam. <laughs> oh my god, it's going to be so bad. We have Sam, uh, who is trying to live a normal life with his girlfriend, Jess. Uh, and things are seeming fine until someone breaks into his house. Surprise his brother, Dean, who has to get um, some help because dad has gone missing on a, and I'm doing it air quotes here, hunting trip, which, I mean, technically is right. He is hunting, um, just not in the traditional sense. Yeah. Um, again, to try to speed things along, uh, Sam is convinced by Dean to go and do this, but get back by Monday because he has to interview for uh, law school. They go on this nice little brotherly road trip. We get some cute bonding. We get a lot of exposition, as I said, and we get our first monster of the week, a lady in white, a traditional ghostly figure usually um the ghost of a woman scorned uh again we see her taking revenge and in this case we learn on men who are unfaithful even if as i said it's a little cheating if she forces herself onto the man thus making them unfaithful thus giving her the right to kill them that's a little like police policing the police which is a whole other story um but we do get our first view of the brothers in action as hunters as hunting down this ghost uh, we get a lot of jargon that is very easy to understand of like, oh, well, dad would have clearly figured this out. So he would have clearly burnt the body because that's the thing we all know to do in this situation, giving us a non-expositional way of showing that there is some professionalism to this. We then learn that dad has gone missing, but left behind his journal, which he would never leave behind, including some coordinates for the brothers to follow. Um, ultimately, we do defeat the woman in white. We get this... Uh, Creepy, wet ghost children. Like, just really. <laughs> we, she is, she like... is brought. She is dragged back to. Sorry, you're having fun with this. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, she is. She is literally dragged back to hell by her ghost children that she allegedly murdered, or at least we learned she did murder. Um, but we then finally get the brothers. You know, that brotherly moment of like, yay, we love each other. We did good. Uh, we're going to go keep finding dad. And then, you know, Sam says to Dean, I can't come with you. I got to go home. I have a loving girlfriend who means everything to me. And nothing could ever happen to her because she's perfect. Mm-hmm. Only to go home and find her stuck on the ceiling, just like mom, and burst into flames, just like mom. 
Luckily, Dean, I guess, wasn't far or was waiting outside for some reason and was able to run in and save him. And I really do love this shot because I think it says so much as an end of the episode, but just Sam going over to the trunk and getting, like, the gear set up because he's like, oh, no, 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 this is personal more so than it already was. We're on this case. Let's go find Dad. Let's figure out what the hell's going on. Wow. That is my recap. That was I, so good. <laughs> I realized I wanted the recap to be like maybe 30 seconds to a minute. I think I went for five minutes. <laughs> well, next Hopefully. time, how about we, we give you like a little challenge to do it in under three minutes? How about that? <laughs> That's it. Plus, I think when you're not also introducing the main characters and the main plot of the show, it's probably a bit easier. Agreed. You know what? At the end of the day, like we're starting this. So let's take more time today. So I, I agree with that. I like this. Good, good, good. All right. So I want to introduce our next sec- uh, next segment. So after my rambly recaps, I would like Mary here to give us a long game view. Uh, did I miss anything? Are there other things you want to bring to my attention, whether as foreshadowing, as I mentioned in my re- uh, recorded recap, or things I may have missed that are of importance? Well, so for this particular one, I think you did a really wonderful job. Um, Thank <laughs> you, you. Knowing especially, I mean, you knew what was going to happen so you you really hit on all of the important points we'll talk about that a little bit later but this is this is the foundation right this is the foundational moment of of the series and so it's it's important to spend time really looking at that one uh when it comes to the the you know the winchester gospel as it will one day be known or be referred to um and it is how we want to look at the show we as we've made it clear we want to really examine the show as a show and not so much as a piece of content created by human beings who live in our world Mm -hmm. so i like the gospel the winchester gospel i kind of like that as a term for Mm -hmm. the show in the sense to kind of divide it further from being just a television experience yes exactly so there's just three little points that i'd like to to add to that particular recap um please yeah for sure so it's something that when the brothers are actually just meeting again you know after fighting because that's what they do dean says oh you know dad is missing and then sam goes oh he's working overtime on miller time he'll be back soon and that seems like a totally normal thing for them right um so Mm -hmm. i think that this paints john as someone who was absent during their childhood because they're used to this it's like this is not even a uh, uh, Dean doesn't even contend that point. He just says, dad's on a hunting trip. And that's when the tone changes. True. And it, it does also kind of go back to a point that uh, Sam does make at some point with Dean. I forget where exactly. But he makes the comment of like, I told dad I was afraid of the thing in my closet. And he gave me a gun. <laughs> he gave me you a know? forty-five. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, I think, again, it, it, to your point, it does paint a picture of John being both sides of the, like, he wasn't the perfect father. No. Because, like he said, I would have wanted a father just to say, don't be afraid of the dark. Mm-hmm. Just the pleasantries you expect of a father of, like, everything will be okay, pat on the back. Mm-hmm. Not, oh, yeah, it's probably this demon. Here's some salt. Here's a gun. Here's how to hunt. Like, mm-hmm. ultimately preparing them for the life that he expects them to have. Yeah. But not the life you really want when you're a child. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, this actually ties in well with the second point that I was going to make because... Just a little further in that particular conversation, uh, when they're when they're leaving and they're talking, Sam asks Dean, "So, Dad, let you go on a hunting trip alone?" And then Dean looks up at him and goes, "Dude, I'm 26." So they're babies. Oh. <laughs> I know, I know, they're such babies. I mean, they're yeah. Which and that that quote sort of paints John as overprotective that he doesn't let the boys go on hunting trips alone even though he has prepared them their entire childhood Mm -hmm. and teenage years for this life so that to me shows that john really has like two sides to him that aren't necessarily coherent with one another so i don't know if there's something that you think about that yeah i think it also goes back to like you're right it connects well is there is kind of that dichotomy of he is a good father and that he's protective he wants to like arm his kids with literal arms and knowledge Mm -hmm. and not just send them off into the world blindly like every other child who just goes like oh i'm afraid of the dark because dark is scary Mm -hmm. he is giving them yes there's more to the world than what you see here's how to defend yourselves but then there's also that level of like 
they're still, I mean, like, back then at least, they're still children. They should still yeah. be given the life of a child. Mm -hmm. There still needs to be some level of, as we see, like, even just within the brothers, the one totally accepting it, becoming a demon hunter and just living like dad, and then the other trying to have a normal life, trying to get away from all that and get the life he couldn't have growing up with a father like John. Absolutely. So we, we see the two different sides of John and the way both sides affected both each kid. Yes. You know, speaking of that normal life, this is where, this is also the episode where they hint at what they think of what, what a normal life looks like, right? Which is what mm -hmm. Sam is living. So that's, you know, the normal apple pie life is sort of defined as somebody who isn't aware of the things in the dark, right? So there's that blissful unawareness, but also that incredible vulnerability to the things that do live in the dark, right? So even the normal apple pie life, as they start defining it in this episode, but also in later seasons, it's a very vulnerable life as they see it. It's true. You think about, like, let's assume we they grew up the lives that most people tend to probably grow up, a normal life where dad says, yes, it's nothing to be afraid of. Look, the closet's empty, and it actually is empty. Mm -hmm. But we've now seen, even in this first episode, over how many years this, this specter has been killing off men. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a world where, in, in this world, it's very clear, there are things that go bump in the night, and they do exist, and either they're explained away, or they are just assumed to be regular murders which is already a weird sentence yeah. but there there is still danger in it absolutely absolutely so i think that recaps quite well the show and i do thank you for bringing up those points they were good talking points and i'm glad we got them up thank you but i know you wanted to and this will be a big part of our show going forward is really discuss the brothers themselves absolutely so, so please take it away. Thank you. So in this particular segment what we would like to do is really look at at the story as if it were mythology. So what if we were to, to have found these episodes, you know, in a black box somewhere and finding out about Sam and Dean Winchester and forgetting for a second that this is a TV show that was written and produced by flawed human beings and, and really focus on the actual story and the characters. Are you with me for that? Yeah, I think that's the best way to look at it. I really like just let's remove the, our world aspect of it and mm -hmm. really view their world as their world. Absolutely. When I watch the pilot, I, I mean, to me, the pilot is really about commitment, right? There's John's commitment to finding what killed Mary, Sam's commitment to a normal life, whatever that means, whatever, however he defines it. And then subsequently, you know, at, at the end of the episode, to a commitment to finding what killed Jessica and his mom. And we also see Dean's commitment, which is to his family, particularly to his dad at this point, and the job, you know, as they call it. Mm -hmm. So the hunting, hunting supernatural things. And finally, we start seeing that commitment of, that the brothers have towards each other. I mean, it's pretty clear when it comes to Dean, because he's the one who literally saved his brother from the fire twice, right, in this particular episode. But we also see yeah. it. For Sam, who is still willing to go and help his brother find his dad, even despite the fact that he uh, has his, uh, a very important interview the following Monday. Exactly. There, there is a level of, I, I think it's something I believe we see a lot more in the show, and hopefully I'm not wrong in saying this, but like family is a very important aspect to them. Yes. And it shows, like, how many people do you think you would turn around and say, hey, I'm going to risk missing this big job interview i'm gonna miss this chance at a normal life mm -hmm. to go on this crazy adventure like yeah it's to check on their father but even you see dean uh sorry you see sam initially <laughs> arguing away that like it's probably fine he's probably just gone a little longer than usual he does that a lot mm -hmm. you know you can go do this yourself it's not that crazy like, even the phone call that Dean receives from his father with the slowdown audio when we clearly hear the woman in white saying, I can't go home, mm -hmm. it doesn't really, and even after seeing the creature, it doesn't feel like anything more supernatural than normal, but still, this is my brother, this is my father, I need to be committed to them, I have to help them. Absolutely. 
And uh, I, I mean, at the end of the day, the pilot is where this is the episode that starts it all. It sets everything in motion. Or mm-hmm. so we are led to believe, right? Oh. Yes. Um, we'll see in later episodes and later seasons what truly sets off this saga, and it's not actually that moment. Oh. Yeah. But it does set the tone for the series when it comes to, to like free will versus destiny and prophecy, right? Like we, we start thinking about that. Like, was Mary meant to die in that fire? Anyway. Food for thought for later. <laughs> oh, I am intrigued. I am now going to be looking for any hint as, like, I'm sure with more, like, end of season episodes I'll see more, but, like, I'm excited now. Ooh, I'm excited. Excellent. <laughs> I'd like to focus in on one moment with you. Please. Yes. So when Dean runs into Sam and Jess's bedroom, and look, it's the first time that he actually sees what happened to his mom, Right. Because until then... Oh, true, yeah. Right? He had only heard whatever John told him. And we don't know what John told him. We can only make assumptions. And, you know, that whole comment about overtime on Miller time sort of allows you a hint into their lives that maybe alcohol was very much present for John during their childhood. And so you don't know what John would have said sober versus what he would have said while while drinking. Um, so you, you don't really know what Dean knows until... He sees Jess burning on the ceiling. That's a brilliant observation. I had not even put that together. You're right. It's true, because he gets handed Sam yeah. literally in the hallway outside. Yeah. He doesn't you can barely see the flames from outside. Yeah. And then true, everything at this point has been hearsay. Like, yes, there's been this very clear getting vengeance for the thing that took their mother away. Mm-hmm. And we clearly see Dean's connection to his mother when they get into the fight on the bridge. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right. This is the first time he's seeing it in action. Absolutely. And I, as much as Sam was present in the room when it happened, he was so young. How much of it does he remember? But I mean, clearly grew up hearing the same stories as Dean because mm-hmm. obviously they were still together as kids up until I'm, I'm going to guess probably college. Mm-hmm. I'm, we'll learn more about that later or you can fill me in if it's not that important. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, this is the first time that either of them are really getting to see it firsthand versus just, you know, fuzzy memory from when you were like, Sam, like, what, a few months old, maybe? A few, a few weeks old. old, maybe, when this took place? Six months old. Uh, Six months old. Yeah. That sounds that sounds like you knew that way too quickly, and it's going to be relevant, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it is going to be relevant, you know? Like, I'm not going to oh, spoil good. things intentionally for you, but certainly, like, when there's little things like that, I'll, I'll definitely speak up. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I called it out during my recording. There's, there's always foreshadowing. This is the kind of show that is just, like drenched in foreshadowing and i think that's a great thing i know i know i think that's partly what makes it so good (laughs) now there's one other thing that i'd like to talk about with you when it comes to to the the brothers and and really looking at at the story as as mythology because what do you make of the fact that their very first monster back together you know after a few years apart is a woman in white because when we think about it when Mary died, she was wearing a white gown. And so I'm I'm wondering the significance of having a woman in white as their first monster of the week. So that is very interesting you bring it up. And I, I will admit, like, I think as you were saying that, I was scrolling through our notes and I just saw the I can never go home uh, highlighted. Yeah. And it's interesting because one of my small complaints about this episode was in the way they tackle the woman in white and the actual legends of a woman in white, they're very accurate. It is very often a woman scorned, usually by a mm-hmm. cheating husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, the legends often talk about killing their own children and then haunting similar men. Mm-hmm. But we do have that interaction between Sam and the, the widowed husband who I, and again, I, I it's all through like body language and just conversation. It almost feels like, he was not unfaithful, that she might have been the one who was unfaithful, which is a whole other problem for the show to get into. But mm-hmm. it, it really feels like the way he responded, like he asks, did you have a happy marriage? And he actively shakes his head no, but says yes with a shaky voice. Like clearly they did not have a happy marriage, but it almost feels like they're trying to paint it in a sense of like, it wasn't his fault it was an unhappy marriage. It was more on her. Yeah, I mean, we can definitely get into that a bit more in our in our later segment. Uh, I certainly have things to say about that. Um, oh, yeah. as I, I think I used the word chauvinist pig at least twice in my recordings. <laughs> um, but I think what, in this case, where I don't want to say it's excusable to make her the villain, mm-hmm. it is 
it's almost like a, a writing crutch to help us get to the idea of her not wanting to go home because yeah. why would like it, it's that not wanting to go home part they really want to drive home it's the brothers themselves are afraid of going back to a normal life mm. because of what they've seen and even further when they actually see it firsthand it's that is sam's moment to go i'm leaving home i can't go back to a normal life this is the life for me this supernatural life oh drew i love that I really do. I mean, I saw it a tad differently, but I really love this interpretation, frankly. It, it makes so much sense. I would love to hear sense. your interpretation, please. Yeah. Well, so mine comes with a little bit more uh, hindsight, you know, with the with what what I know happens in the later seasons. And so foresight. <laughs> yes. I Yes, it's Hi- true. Hindsight for you, <laughs> foresight for us. Weird. It's so true. You know, I, I sort of always see myself as like being like in season 15, but it's true. We are in season one. So I need to get that straight. So thank you for, for bringing me back where <laughs> we mean, actually are. I, I genuinely think it works in both ways. I just think true. it's kind of a funny observation at the moment more. <laughs> All right. So this idea of like, I can never go home and the woman in white, because so the way that I read the woman in white as described in this episode is a woman who has killed her children out of grief. And in this case, it was the grief of her relationship with her husband. Right. So for whatever Mm -hmm. reason, she was very she was grieving and she killed her children as a result. Well, what we know of Mary is that At some point in her life, before she has children, in a moment of extreme grief, she makes a decision that will change the course of of her life and of everybody's life around her. So the woman in white kills her two children in a fit of grief. And to me, that sort of mirrors how Mary later feels, you know, she she feels like Sam and Dean's lives were, were stolen from them because of her actions. And that idea of not being able to go back home to her family, I think, is like it just it it's a call. <laughs> I was going to say call back, but like a call forward, I guess, like foreshadowing then uh, to what happens in much later seasons. Oh, man, like I can't wait to get to those moments so we can like reflect on these now. And again, the advantage of watching them in a compressed time like we're doing now, mm. it'll be really easy to like make those connections. I'm to be like, oh, like three years ago in season one, it'll be like few weeks ago in season one i know one of the the advantages of watching a show like this but oh i'm very excited to see those kind of connections because again with my minimal knowledge of the show for my first attempt of watching through it haphazardly is like most monster of the week shows a lot of episodes can be character development and you know furthering the plot in its own way but those really nice overarching tie-ins of like dotting these little like points together with a little red string like mm-hmm. you're doing right now which I, makes you sound crazy when you're not uh <laughs> although in this universe it seems like a thing that would be happening anyways that's a whole other story um <laughs> it'll be nice to have those kind of points i'm looking forward to those episodes because as much as i can think of episodes i've enjoyed in the past i can't really think of like how they tied into the overarching story besides mm-hmm. just some themes and some development i can't wait to find those moments of like really being able to draw like oh their story began here and now we learn this about their mother or oh john's secret over here like i can't wait to weave that web oh my god oh yay i'm so excited that i'm getting you excited <laughs> about this Woo-hoo, it's working oh my god i'm so excited <laughs> so i feel like that gets us a good recap of the episode a good recap of the brothers and where they are and the story points we want to bring up and their development Mm-hmm. And I know you wanted to get a little more critical on the show. Uh, Absolutely. Kind of not necessarily every ep- uh, I don't think we'll be do- going this deep every episode, but as this is the first episode, we want to look a little more at the world in which the show is being put together. Yes, absolutely. So the goal is to sort of contextualize the episode a little bit and, you know, how we put a pin in the fact that this, sh- this is a TV show made by flawed human beings. Well, we're removing that pin now and we're just sort of like, letting that flood in and taking that very much into account. So in terms of contextualizing the show a little bit, um, we'll be able to dive into each episode and into this a little bit more with the different, with the f- future episodes. Uh, but just to kind of give an idea and a reminder also, especially for people who may not be super familiar with Supernatural, this show aired or began airing in 2005. So this first episode came out on September uh, on Friday, September 13th, 2005. Now Drew, do you remember where you were in 2005? That is 15 years ago, yes. which means I would have been 
just shy of, I would have been just turning 16 a few weeks later. Mm-hmm. Uh, 15 years old. I can't remember. Is that, you still in high school at 15? Yes, you are still in high school yes? at 15. <laughs> okay, wow. God, it shows my, uh, uh, I dropped out of school at a young age, so still. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was in high school. I was dating my first girlfriend at the time, because I think she's the one who got me onto the show initially. Okay. But that's about all I can remember from 2005. <laughs> my I- God. And you know what? I think that's sort of my point, right? Like, it's been a long time. <laughs> mm-hmm. And this was obviously pre-Me Too, pre a lot of different reckonings about diversity that have happened since. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that is very visible, especially in the first few seasons. So there's definitely a lot of critique to be made, a lot of observations to be made. But that's why I want to contextualize it. This episode came out in 2005. Again, to give you an idea, you know, Jared Padalecki, who plays Sam, was fresh out of Gilmore Girls, where he plays a dean, obviously, which is why Drew is which still is, so yes. confused. <laughs> and I'm also a huge Gilmore Girls fan. It's one of the shows that I have probably watched through. Like Mary with Supernatural, a number of times I cannot recall how many times, <laughs> and I still go back to watch episodes when I need to pick me up. Yeah. So I don't know how long it'll take me of watching Supernatural or if we'll ever reach that point, but there will always be that itch in the back of my head to get Sam and Dean's names mixed up because of it. That's that's totally fine. I See, when I watch Gilmore Girls, I always find it weird that they call him Dean. I'm like, that's not Dean, that's <laughs> Sam. <laughs> oh, two sides of the coin. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so Jared Padalecki was fresh out of Gilmore Girls and Jensen Ackles had already been on Dawson's Creek and Smallville amongst others, you know. We know that he got his start on uh, on Days of Our Lives. So that's that's actually pretty cool. And in Smallville, just as a cool point of information or cool so I think, uh, he had originally auditioned for the role of Clark Kent. Yeah, I, I couldn't see him as a Clark Kent type. I mean, again, knowing him mostly from Supernatural, <laughs> like it's always that like, you know, you you put a lot of like your thoughts of a char- of a person on their ability to play a certain character you connect them with. Mm-hmm. Like my favorite one to bring up is you think of Hugh Laurie as house and you forget that he was the father in Stuart Little. Like you could not be two more opposite <laughs> characters and he does it well, but he, that's a whole other story. Hugh Laurie was also man on plane in Friends. <laughs> Oh my god, yes. I I know the episode too. Yes, it's a great episode. <laughs> I, can, I can picture the episode. Oh my god. Um, we're getting away from ourselves, but that's yes, totally fine. bringing it back. <laughs> yes, please. So we know that the that Supernatural plays on the CW, right? Mm-hmm. Well, in two- Which I feel is a channel that is kind of famous for shows of a certain nature. Yes, absolutely. So I don't... I, see, this is where, like, I'm not a TV buff in that sense. So, like, I don't know which show plays on what channel, what station, etc. But mm-hmm. I do know that at the time where this started, the CW didn't exist. It was the WB. Oh, really? So it wasn't actually... Okay. Yeah, right. So this is how far oh. back we're going, right? And again, like I said, we'll have a lot of time in future episodes to talk about Eric Kripke a little bit more. But just, again, like as a way to introduce this, originally this was supposed to be a three season show and that's why like you'll see in the first seasons that the arc is so well defined because this is really like what they had in mind i think that's something i even recall when i did my first watch through as i said previously i only made it so far in my watch through before and when we get there we'll discuss it more it just put a taste in my mouth of like i don't really love where the story is going Mm -hmm. and i'm kind of getting detached from everything and i'm hoping both our conversations and going in with a fresher outlook on the show and also not having to do that whole wait a week and a whatever two weeks for an episode to come out mm-hmm. uh, might make it a little easier to like swallow some of those less enjoyable moments. Yeah, But it, it's true. Like I remember really, really enjoying the show up until an arbitrary point. I want to say season like the end of season four or the end of season three where I was kind of just like, eh. Yeah. So you saying that it was meant to be three seasons, Mm -hmm. you know, I've seen other shows suffer with this where the show was really meant to be so many seasons. I mean, I think a famous example is uh, Parks and Recreation. Speaking of other shows, let's make a quick list of the show that debuted in 2005. Yes, I see that you've included this in our show notes. Yes. (laughs) I was reading it a bit and I'm like shocked by some of them, but please go ahead and read them off. I know, I know, I know. Honestly, it's just like it reminds you of how far back this actually was, right? Like I said, Supernatural began on Friday, September 13th, which is known in the fandom as Supernatural Day. But 
Other notable shows that debuted in 2005 are Medium, who started on NBC. Now, that's not a show that I watched, but I know that it was a big thing at the time. I know that the people who got into it got really into it. Like, that's what I remember. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this little show called, like, Grey's Anatomy. I don't know if you've heard of it. It it rings a bell. bell, I I feel like I've seen an episode or two here and there. It's it's not still running, is it? (laughs) It is, actually. I can't believe that Grey's Anatomy actually outlived Supernatural, but they did. Grey's Anatomy's first few episodes started in early 2005. As we know, like the season, season one is a bit shorter than the rest of the seasons because they weren't sure that it was going to work. They were taking a chance on Shonda Rhimes. Uh, can you imagine taking a chance on Shonda Rhimes? I'm taking a chance on Shonda right? Rhimes. Anyway. Oh my God. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but I will admit, the non-sarcasm this time, the next show on your list, mm-hmm. uh, Wildfire? Yeah. No recollection. So the reason why I put that here is because uh, the, one, the main character in that particular show then moves on to Supernatural, Wildfire, on, hmm. on ABC Family. And the re- so I put it there specifically for Genevieve, who will move on to Supernatural and end up marrying Jared Padalecki. Uh, so I feel like, you know, again, because this is the supernatural family, I had to include wildfire. So while I didn't watch it, I also know that this is something that when Gen- when Genevieve, <laughs> at least you heard of it. I ha- well, I'd, I heard of it only because of Genevieve. Right. So like whenever when okay, she I came guess, over yeah. to the show, I know that people were, were happy to see her. So there was like that maybe crossover in age, right? Where, like, people who were watching, like, the kids who were watching Wildfire then started watching Supernatural, like... Okay, maybe that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I can see that. Another little show that started in 2005 is, is <laughs> It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Which I also am shocked at how old that show is. Like, I feel like I only really heard about it in the last, like, five to seven years, and, like, to know it's been going on since I was, like, in high school is shocking. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the cult following for this one, right? Again, like, especially when shows have been yeah. out for this long. Uh, the reason why they're still alive is b- really basically because the fans love it. So <laughs> uh, then the next on my list is Prison Break and Bones, who were both on Fox at the time. So I never really got into Prison Break, but again, I know that that was a huge thing. I really remember, like, the phenomenon. Uh, I liked mm-hmm. Bones uh, quite a bit. Bones I tried to like, and I just, I think I got through most of the first season, and I just, I was like, I feel like I'm forcing myself to watch this. Yeah. But Prison Break 2, again, like, I know the phenomenon, mm-hmm. and I just never jumped on it either. Mm-hmm. Another But uh, the next one. The next one, though, How I Met Your Mother on CBS, again, a huge, huge popular success. It, it, it'd be interesting to rewatch it today to see how it aged. Yeah, I feel like even watching it, like, when it was live, yeah. there were, like... There are things I can remember being like, ooh, yeah, that didn't Cringy. age well already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, just... But the, Alison Hannigan, self-love. So just the character of Barney would have to be rewritten entirely today. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be clear. Yeah. <laughs> and then finally, I, I like to mention this one because it's actually comparable-ish in terms of, like, horror uh, content is Criminal Minds. Which is another one, too, I didn't, I didn't follow per se, but I really do like the show. Uh, same you know what like I watched the first I think nine seasons but then anyway you know like life happened (laughs) but uh, yeah I think it was one of those shows that just like I liked it I I watched it quite frequently with my mother of all people actually Mm. and I think I just sort of fell off at some point again Criminal Minds now I can't remember from the research that I did if it is if it ended last year or if it's ended I know that they did 15 seasons as well so that means that that show and Supernatural, I think, are similar in that sense, right? Like, they both started mm-hmm. at a very different time and yet still managed to keep a following important enough to, to survive through these, like, cultural awakenings that we've had in the past few years. So that, that was, that's the, the con- context, I guess, of the show and where it started and everything. So hopefully we've we've set the scene for anyone who's joining the show as a new listener like myself yeah. to kind of get in the mind space of where the world was when the show did air. Because, again, as much as we do want to look at this separate from our world and the things that happen, we still want to hold it accountable mm-hmm. for things. Like I've said, I, I said it before in my recap, like this episode is a little on the chauvinistic side. I mean, yes. we literally have, I think, a total of 
four, wait, one, two, three, four, five female characters in the entire episode. Mm -hmm. And two of them have virtually no lines and are killed. Mm -hmm. One is literally the villain who has, again, very few lines. The most talkative we get are the two exposition girls in the diner explaining the ghost story and talking about her dead boyfriend. Well, yes. So, uh... (laughs) Yeah. You're right. I mean, this is frank. And if I if I'm just like being very honest and open about, you know, I, I love the show. I really do. But when I started watching it, I had a lot of trouble with a lot of that because it felt it felt so behind. Right. At the time that I was watching it, I started watching it about four years ago and already it had been 11 years right and and some of these things just seemed so out of place like you said the fact that there are you know five female characters in this particular episode and can you count the people of color also in in that in that episode i think there's one black cop there you go so yeah so i think that definitely the show was not aware or or no i don't like to use that word but there was definitely no effort made to 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 remove a white supremacist undertone to it right so that's that's definitely something yeah i don't i don't want it to come across that we're saying it's intentionally Mm -hmm. a very whitewashed cast i think that's almost a byproduct of the way the industry really was at the time Mm -hmm. and is something we are seeing an active combat against now Mm -hmm. we are seeing a lot more call to arms of people of color, indigenous people Mm -hmm. getting into roles and being cast properly. Mm -hmm. And I think this was just a matter of the time that... Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's why that's why we have this particular segment, right? To be able to discuss these things and Mm -hmm. uh, and and to to have like a a true critical appraisal of, of what's happening in that particular show. And like you said, you know, a lot of these decisions are made by the network. Also, few of those decisions are actually made by the the people writing the show. So mm-hmm. anyway, and it's it would be easy to look at the te- at just the text, you know, the script of the show and say, oh, well, I would have done a different casting, which would be absolutely fair. But that decision didn't come to it came to a very specific set of people who had a very specific agenda. And that shows. Yeah. So I, I will look forward to as we get into later seasons, hopefully mm-hmm. seeing more diversity in the casting and being able to definitely talk to it when we get. Perfect. And I know that now that we've gone through our critical analysis a little bit, mm-hmm. we have a voicemail from a fan of the show who wanted to uh, voice her opinion as well. This week's voicemail comes from Rochelle Castellano, who wanted to share her impressions of the pilot with us. Lawrence, 22 years ago, the start of it all. An innocuous timestamp, John Winchester's smiling face, calling out her famous pie lover's name, Dean. So much of Supernatural's mythology is centered around that moment, around John, Mary, the boys. So much groundwork is set up in those first few minutes of pilot. So little of what's to come is known to us at first watch. Expectedly, of course. But those feelings of intrigue are clear. I vividly remember how enthralling the first episode of Supernatural was. I was drawn so deeply to the show's centerpieces. The Winchester Boys, Sam and Dean. Watching the show as it first unfolded, so many years ago now, provided me with such a sense of newness and awe. There was nothing like it back then. All that darkness, those rich undertones of family drama peeking through, you know, the ones that drive you to tune in every week because that's really what it's all about. All of it is set to a perfect backdrop of horror-esque elements for those of us who love a good frisson. Those flickering lights in that opening scene. Who's standing over Sam's crib? What happens to Mary? And then those little elements. The look on Dean's face as John tells him to take Sam and run. My heart breaks. Looking back now, I'm still drawn to the narrative elements from that first episode. Full circles. Pilot begins with Mary pinned to a wall, bursting into flame. Ends with Jess meeting a similar fate. The nuances and the narrative threads that Kripke fleshes out over the course of the first season as he steadily builds his way to the finale of season five all start in Pilot. I love that most. Pilot, as any show, 
was still growing in its mythology. There are some funny incongruities with how the show letter dealt with its demons, exorcisms, its own mythology, really. But the bones are there, enough so that it hooks you into staying. It did back then, it does now. When I can bring myself to rewatch Pilot, of course. It promised me one hell of a ride, and did it ever deliver. Wow, that was really beautiful. Thank you, Rochelle, for being both our first voicemail and such a great one. I, I can really I can really connect. You're right. I mean, both however many years ago, back when I was 15 years old, seeing this for the first time and really getting kind of the claws into me. It really was a show that I saw myself going through and watching uh, as much as later on I, I fell off the boat. This first episode really draws you in and coming back to it as I did this week, my first rewatch after 15 years, it really did it again. It reminded me why I wanted to watch it. And you're right. And I really want to thank you again for almost expressing what this entire episode was trying to be in such a beautiful, concise two minutes. Maybe you'll give me some pointers for my next recap. <laughs> oh, Rochelle, thank you so much for this beautiful voicemail. I, I totally understand what you say when you're, what you mean when you say that you don't watch, rewatch the, the pilot often. I have to say that whenever I do a rewatch, I'll tend to skip over the pilot because it's just so painful, especially when we know what happens later and the sacrifice that the brothers have to actually, you know, carry on with. So I, I definitely related to that. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm so excited to get to a point where I feel the same way about the pilot as well, but I'm so intrigued to see how we get there. <laughs> Obviously, we are going to encourage any listeners of the show to reach out to us. At the end of the show, uh, we will uh, give the email and all the information you need, but you can definitely send in your thoughts, whether they be about the series as a whole, a specific episode, either you just watched or one coming up. We are happy to hear any and all from any of our fans. Mm -hmm. And I will, because so many shows do this, and I always want to drive the point home, in your emails, let us know what name to use for you, whether it's your full name and nickname or just part of your name and your pronouns. Yes, and also if there's any feedback that you'd like to send us about our show, this particular episode, or any future ones, uh, please feel free. Mary actually presented this idea to us. It was one of the first ideas I think we really had solidified when we thought of, when the show was presented to me by her. <laughs> and I love the idea of, and even from my minimal viewing of the show, I know that a common thread throughout the series is making a deal with the devil or at the crossroads. Mm -hmm. So we thought every episode would be fun to end it, both as a little uh, sign off for the show but also as a kind of talking point for the listeners to think of their own and even share them with us on social media what would be your deal at the crossroads for this episode uh so mary would you like to go first yes um so this one is a tough one because you can't make a deal to change too much right because otherwise this mm -hmm. the story doesn't happen um, so I am going to go super controversial, like super controversial and say that Ooh. I would give up John living and ask f and wish for Mary to stay alive. But still filling the same roles they currently do fill within the series, essentially. Uh, I mean, we would see how that would go, right? Because we can't, like, I can't True. put conditions on the deal, right? So my my deal would be that in that moment, that night, you know, in Lawrence, uh, that John actually dies in the bedroom and Mary lives. And that would be my crossroads deal for this one. I like that. It's very overarching. It's very big. It opens up a lot of possible questions, but mm. I think it goes to a point that, I, I, we both drove home a little bit earlier, is it might help the diversification of the casting having a prominent female character much earlier on in the series. I know we do get a few female characters who become a little more prominent later, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. But it would help earlier on. Yes. What about you, Drew? Coming a little more blind, it's a tough one. I, and again, it's a deal with the devil. There's always has to be a downside to this, yeah. so it's, it's hard to say. But I think for me, my favorite part of the show, the thing that drove me into it, and I know hopefully we will get more into the overarching story and help me love it there. I love the monster of the week. I think I would have loved to have found a way to develop the spirit more, uh, how she became where she was, mm -hmm. kind of disambiguify, if that's even a word, mm -hmm. how she became 
so torn in her marriage that led to the killing of her children and why facing her children was the thing that like you know took her away like a lot of it is filling in the blanks and kind of like figuring it yourself but if we could have divulged i feel like we had to give up on some of that yeah. to get more of the pilot in mm-hmm. i would have loved to have maybe seen leave more mystery which we could then figure out later on in the series about the brothers and their history and their their life okay in order to get more of the monster this week okay so you would give up a little bit of the overarching story in this particular episode in order to get more maybe concrete lore about this particular uh spirit Yes, okay. again, a great example of someone taking my flubbering for five minutes and making it a concise <laughs> thought. Thank you. you. You and Rochelle complimented me immensely. Oh, uh, well, we're happy to. <laughs> so again, we do want to reach out to any of our listeners and invite you to uh, let us know what deal you would make if you agree or disagree or have an interesting point based on the deals we have chosen to make, as well as any other thoughts or feedback you can offer us. But Mary, I think that brings us to the end of our first episode. Absolutely. You've been listening to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Mary Vigahu and myself, Drew Schulman. Subscribe on Spotify or Apple Music for weekly content, including special episodes. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Carrying Wayward. And feel free to send us a voicemail at carryingwayward at gmail.com. This week, we'd like to thank Rochelle for her voicemail. Until next week. Carry on, our wayward friends.